Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to My Victory Church. We're excited that you all have joined us this wonderful, beautiful, do I dare say it, maybe spring? No, I'm not even going to say it. I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> Praise God. Well, welcome, and we're excited that you're here. Well, let's welcome everyone that's joining us online, wherever you are around the world. Welcome to all of you online and Facebook Live. We're excited that you're with us. Before I get into the message, I just want to celebrate a couple of things. The first thing I want to celebrate is tonight we are going to be having and hosting our, our first uh, graduation for our Bible college. We just are ready with the first season or the first year of our Bible colleges. It, that went fast. It is is already completed and we've got graduates we're excited to uh, celebrate tonight and uh, so proud of Pastor Gene and the faculty and everything that, that what they've done this year and maybe you don't know maybe you're not aware we have a Bible college right here in our church and maybe what you're not aware of is that we offer courses not just throughout the day but we offer evening courses and different you know weekend courses in the summer we've got a couple weekend courses coming up we're excited about in the fall we've got evening courses to uh, that you, you know to avail yourself to that you'd be you know I think would be you'd enjoy and would be a benefit to you and if you're interested at all in taking any Bible college courses or if that sounds appealing to you on May 6th we're having an info night and you can get all the details uh, uh, as to what's coming up this summer and into the fall into year two of Victory Bible College. Also, next weekend, we are having, um, our, uh, celebrating our, we're not celebrating, but we're hosting uh, Victory Women's Conference, and, and that, that's going to be a lot of fun and really exciting. And we still have a few spaces open, ladies, so if you want to register for Victory Ladies Conference, it is uh, next weekend, Friday and Saturday, and you're not going to want to miss it. We've got a great speaker coming in for, from Tacoma, Washington. She's, we heard her speak last year at, at a conference, and she was amazing, and we think you're going to be really blessed by that. Also, our team was rehearsing yesterday for the conference. They got some really cool, special stuff um, prepared for you, and you're going to be spoiled and pampered and, and ministered to, and it's going to be awesome. So if you're interested in that, you can, uh, you can go to the lobby and sign up in the lobby and, uh, for the women's conference. And also, if you're online and want to, you're interested or in the area and could make it out next weekend, you can go online and register for the women's conference at our website, myvictory.ca. All right. Now, we are in part four of our series, uh, uh, The Six Anchors, and it's based on this one verse in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. It's this. It says, this hope, and this is what this series is all about. We are searching for this hope. Because this, it defines, the, the writer of Hebrews defines this hope as a confident assurance. And have you ever noticed somebody that has a confident assurance? They carry themselves differently. They're, they're you know, more, a lot more attractive. And, and they have, seem to have more success around them. And seem, things seem to go better because they, they just seem to walk with this confidence. And vice versa, you see others that walk with a lack of confidence or insecurity. And it doesn't seem as, I mean, it's not as attractive. And we want to have a confident assurance. But not only that, it, this hope is defined as an anchor of the soul. That's why we've entitled it Six Anchors. But here's, here's the definition the Amplified Bible says, It cannot slip and it cannot break down under whatever pressure bears upon it. And that is what we're looking for. We're looking for a hope that cannot slip, that cannot break, no matter the pressure that, that bears upon it. And there's lots of things that we can lean into, lots of hopes that we can lean into and, and trust, but not everything that we hope in or put our trust in is qualifies as one that is never going to slip or never going to break. There's lots of things I've hoped in, lots of things I've trusted in, some good, some not so good. But, but even the good ones, they don't qualify as an anchor that holds no matter the pressure put on it. Yet what we're looking for in, in this series, we're looking for in the Bible where it tells us, instructs us to where to place our hope and hope that qualifies as ones that will never slip, never break, no matter the pressure put on it. Now the first, the first anchor that we talked about was the word of God. And he said, the word of God is one that qualifies. David said it in the Psalms. He says, I choose. And he was in the middle of a storm. He's in the middle of trials. And he was in the middle of, of you know, enemies attacking him and a whole bunch of things going on. And he says, I put, I choose to put my hope or to place my hope in the word. In other words, 
I, I love how he says it because he's not saying, I feel like trusting God. I feel like trusting his word. He says, I choose. I'm placing, I'm making the choice to place my hope there, knowing that the word of God is more sure, is more secure than the feelings I'm, I'm facing or the circumstances around me or the emotions inside of me. I know the word of God is more stable, is more sure, and I place my hope there. And we see it in the New Testament. Paul, the apostle, said the same thing, that I'm, I'm leaning into and I'm trusting the hope that, that is the word of God. And I've known in my own life, in my own circumstances, that when I, I least feel like it is when, is when the word of God seems to be the anchor that's even more sure. And, and, and it is. It's an anchor that you can stand on. The word of God has stood for thousands of years. It, it is something different about that book than any other book. It's not only the best-selling book still in the world, even though governments have tried to ban it, even though they're trying to remove it from our schools and trying to make it illegal. Actually, that's going on right now in Canada. They're trying to make it illegal again in Canada. It, even, I mean, they can do whatever they want with this, uh, but the word of God, governments have tried, but it's standing sure. And not only that, there's something in it that is, is, is more than just words on a page. There's something in it that is life that's alive, that is relevant thousands of years later that still works. And it's, it's an anchor that we can stand, stand on. Many of us in this room can attest to that. The second anchor that we looked at is, is the anchor that is Jesus. And Jesus is a hope. Like I said you know, earlier, I don't know how people live life without Jesus. I've done lots of funerals as a pastor, and there's a big, big difference between doing a funeral of someone who knew Jesus and doing a funeral of somebody who didn't know Jesus. There's a big difference, and the big difference is the reaction of the family. There's tears at everyone, there's sorrow at everyone, but there's a confident assurance at the ones at the funerals with families that know Jesus and know that the person who passed away knew Jesus. There's just something there's something different. There's an assurance there. There's a confidence there that is just not there at all in, in funerals with people that don't have Jesus. And I have no idea. Like I said, I have no idea how people do life without the hope that is Jesus. He really is someone that we can lean on that with regardless of circumstances, he, he stands and he holds true. The third anchor we looked at is, is last week we looked at the anchor of heaven. And the Bible says this, because of the resurrection of Jesus, that makes him God, that makes him anchor we can lean into. Because of that one event, we know that, we, that life does not end here. We know because Jesus is the forerunner of that. We know that there is something that we, we can look forward to. There's an eternity ahead of us. There's something that we can look forward to. And that our anchor in heaven, our anchor in that eternity is set. It is steadfast. It is safe because of, of, what, of Jesus and because of what he did. That's good because that means no matter what, this is what this is what this anchor is. No matter what, our hope is always we can't lose. Our hope is always set. We're always sure. No matter what, just the fact that heaven is real and we we know that uh, we because of that we cannot lose, no matter what. And I want to continue on this morning off of this one. And I mean these these three anchors, you look at these and I just got to be honest with you, these three are pretty obvious. They're pretty easy for me to find as a believer when I was looking in the Bible studies, you know, they're pretty obvious. The next three not so obvious and they, you know, and yet I found some of them, I found of these last three anchors were a little bit of a surprise to me that these are where the Bible says to place our our hope and we're going to look at number 4 today and it it's launching right off of this one. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, and when he's talking about destroyed, he's talking to a, a group of people who are being persecuted uh, for their faith, and, they're, and many of them being martyred and killed. And literally, he says, the tent that we live in, he's talking about our earthly bodies. He says, literally, literally the people he's talking to, it's very realistic that their body could be destroyed for their faith. And so he's saying, hey, we know that if that happens, if this body gets destroyed, we have a building from God. It's a, this is a tent, but there's a building. That's something a lot more secure about a building than a tent, especially in Lethbridge. <laughs> we used to own a tent as a church. Now it's four tents. I, anyway, it blew away um, somewhere in Saskatchewan. <laughs> We, 
It was big too. Was, anyway, uh, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. Okay, this is what he's saying. There's, our anchor is more sure. This, this, is ten, this is temporary. But in heaven, we have something in heaven, not built by human hands, so it's going to stand. And then he says, meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we are not to be found naked. What he's talking about is we're longing for, for this. We long for, for, heaven is so good, it's something he's longing for. He's not suicidal. He's just saying, hey, the pain that I'm feeling here, what we're enduring here, he's writing this from prison, not a comfortable place, the persecution I'm getting, the abuse that I'm getting, all of this, he says, there's not going to be pain in heaven. There's not going to be sorrow in heaven. There's not going to be weeping in heaven. He says, heaven is going to be a place that I long for because the pain we're enduring here is only temporary. And this this is what he's saying. We're not going to be left found vulnerable. When we die, there's, 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 it's safe and it's steadfast. Then he says in verse 4, For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. This is talking about you know, the pain and the burdens that we, we face here. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And I love this statement because, because we often talk about death is the one that swallows up life. And yet Paul says this, he says, life actually swallowed up death. Because of Jesus, life swallows up death. That when you die, you're going to be swallowed up in life eternal if you believe in Jesus. That, that, that's that's kind of cool. It's opposite of what, what you know, most would think or say. But then he says this, verse 5. Now, the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God. Okay, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Now, when he's talking about the spirit, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And, and I, and I got to preface this a little bit. When Jesus ascended into, in, into heaven, he, says, he said, I want you to wait. He's telling his, his disciples, and he says, I want you guys to wait in Jerusalem in the upper room until the Holy Spirit comes. And they're going, well, um, you know, how, how are we going to know? And Jesus, you'll know. Okay, so they waited, and we see in Acts chapter 2 that they waited, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit, like a mighty rushing wind, came on them. There's an event where they suddenly got filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting because because Jesus said this to his disciples in, in John. When they first discovered, he asked them this question, he says, who do you say that I am? And he finally, they finally realized you're unusual. There's, you know, miracles that happen. That you walk on water. You you speak, and the wind stops. You raise people from the dead. You do all these things. We perceive these guys are intelligent. We perceive you might be the one. You might be the Messiah. You might be the Christ, the promised one. And Jesus goes, Hey, yeah, yeah you're right. So they just realize that their best friend is God. And then Jesus, right after that, says to them, "And I'm going to leave you." And they're thinking, no, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty good deal that our best friend is God. That's, that's, that's a pretty good deal. I mean, you know, one of our friends, Lazarus, got sick and, and died, and you just raised him up again. So we're feeling pretty confident here. You know, any of us get, you know, you know leprosy or blindness, or, I mean, you just heal. So it, it, we're, feeling, we're feeling pretty confident you're, you're God. And we're, when we're hungry, I mean, you just turn you know, one loaf into a whole meal. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty good. And when we're thirsty, you take, we're bored of water. I mean, life is good. And he says, no, no, no. He says, I, I'm going to leave. And they're like, don't leave. I mean, just imagine. How confident would you be if Jesus attended this church in person? How confident would you be if he's sitting here on the front row and you're like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you would be confident. You would come to church on Sunday and you go, Jesus, could I, could I borrow? I, I, could you pray for me? Could you help me with, you know, I've got this problem. Could you help me with this? I, I'm not feeling well. Could you pray for me? I, you know, business not going well. Could you help me? You'd feel pretty confident if Jesus was here in person. And, and the disciples felt pretty confident. And then Jesus says this, it's better that I go. And the disciples are going, how does it get any better? And he says, no, it's better that I go because if I didn't go, you wouldn't receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's better that you have the Holy Spirit than if I was here personally. Now think about that. The disciples had no 
no understanding of how in the world could he mean that would be better. And yet, he said better. And he says this, in, in fact, he says this in, in John 14. He says, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Okay, they're still not grasping it. They write this down and they, we obviously John wrote it down, but they're still not grasping what this means. And, and here's, here's what is interesting about all this is that, and I've got a, an anchor here. Um, this is for a small boat, obviously. And this is for, for sand and, and, you know, for boats, to, for sand. The anchors are made for something, you know, different specific things. But this is a, a, a small anchor for a small boat. But here's, here's the point that I want to make. Is, is that an anchor is only as effective as the chain attached to it. Isn't that true? I mean, if, if a flimsy string or, or a, a rope was attached to this, how many know that it doesn't matter how effective or how nice or how shiny or how, how big the anchor is, if the, the rope or the chain attached to it is not sufficient, it doesn't matter how good the anchor is, it's not gonna hold. The anchor is only as efficient as the chain attached to it. And have you ever been to the, you know, the coast and, and you've seen these big ships, these massive ships? Have you ever seen the chain that, that you know, the anchor that, that unrolled and the chain that unrolls that anchor? Those chains are huge, massive. And the reason why they're so big is because the ship is so big and, and the pressure put on it, that anchor, that, that, it's not just the anchor that needs to hold, it's the chain that needs to hold. Because it's only as effective as the chain attached to it. And here's, here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus said this, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of the anchor of heaven. Okay, the Holy Spirit, is. I send you the Spirit to guarantee heaven. And then what he's saying is the, the, the Holy Spirit is the chain attached to the anchor of heaven that's going to hold. He's the guarantee. He also said this, he says, I will send you the Holy Spirit who's going to teach you everything I have said to you, everything that's in the word. The Holy Spirit is the chain that attaches the word of God. It's, it's what holds the words sure. Okay. He also says this in John 16, I still have many things to tell you, but you can't handle them now. But when the friend comes, the Holy Spirit of truth, he will take you by the hand and guide you into all the truth there is. And I like this part. It says, he won't draw attention to himself, but I will make, but will make sense of what is about to happen. And indeed, out of all that has been done and said. In other words, he says, the, the, the Holy Spirit is now going to be the bring attention not to himself but bring attention to Jesus that he is the chain he is the it's, it's actually called a road r o d e is what they call a chain that attaches an anchor he is the road or the rope or the chain that attaches the anchor of Jesus to us that he's the guarantee he's the guarantee for Jesus he's the guarantee for the word he's the guarantee for heaven Okay, this is good. And I like this part that says he, he will, won't draw attention to himself. Because sometimes, you know, even when we talk about the Holy Spirit, some of you are, are a little bit uncomfortable and going, oh, Holy Spirit. Uh, because we see, well, it's, that's weird. The Holy Spirit is weird. And listen to me. Listen, listen. The Holy Spirit's never meant to be weird. The Holy Spirit's not weird. We're weird sometimes. Okay. Holy Spirit's not meant to be weird. He's not meant, listen, he's not meant to draw attention to himself. The Holy Spirit's job is not to draw attention to himself. And some of us, crazy charismatic sometimes, we behave in such a way that we make the Holy Spirit the spectacle. The Holy Spirit's never meant to be the spectacle. He's never meant to draw attention to himself. He's, his purpose is to draw attention to Jesus. That's why he came, amen? That's the Spirit. Now look at this. And will make sense. And will make sense. And will make sense. I'm sorry, I'm stepping on some holy cows now, but. <laughs> okay. The Holy Spirit points to Jesus and makes sense. It's not supposed to be strange and confusing and out there and bizarre. 
The Holy Spirit is a, a perp, on purpose for a purpose. The Holy Spirit is meant to be our guarantee for the anchor that is heaven, is meant to be the one that reveals the word to us, that when you read the word, you can make sense of it and bring it. That's what the Holy Spirit's purpose is. Holy Spirit is meant to have you understand Jesus in a whole nother way and have relationship with Jesus. That's why Jesus said, it's better that I go away because you'll receive the Holy Spirit in you. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. It's better than Jesus around you you have God himself in you that that's better amen and you can understand this now look at this the Holy Spirit it, it when you become born again you begin a relationship with Jesus you ask Jesus to be Lord of your life the Bible says you will receive the Holy Spirit that you you receive the Holy Spirit there so all of you who are believers have received the Holy Spirit but the Bible also makes it clear that there's a separate thing as far as just than getting the Holy Spirit as a believer, there's a separate thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the word baptism simply means immersion. It means a full dose. And here's the easiest way that I can explain it. When you get born again, you receive not just the anchors, you receive the road or the chain or the rope to all of those anchors by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is not just the chain, he's also an anchor himself. Okay, and here, this is why I can say that confident, because in, in Romans, and this surprised me quite honestly, but look at this, in Romans 15, verse 13, it says, may the God of hope, so we know that God and Jesus are an anchor of hope, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope. See, I, I get hope here, but wouldn't it be better to overflow with hope? And overflow, by the way, is a good baptism word. Immersion is complete. It's over. It's more than enough. It's about. It's, it's hope beyond. Okay, with hope by the power. How do I overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit? That the that the Holy Spirit is not just a chain, not just an attachment to guarantee all of the other anchors. He's an anchor himself. And here's, here's how it works, that when you receive the Holy Spirit and you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you invite the Holy Spirit to fill you. Watch what happens. This is, this is what he says in Galatians. He says, so I walk by the Spirit and you will not, he says, walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Now this is, let me explain this. It's much like what I explained with, the, you know, with Jesus and money, that there's an opposite. For every anchor of hope that is secure, there is an opposite anchor, or opposite hope that we lean on that doesn't qualify because if we lean on it, it gives way. It's kind of like leaning on a wall. You can only lean, put all of your weight on a wall. If you've got two walls, you can only put all of your weight on one or the other. You can't lean on both. And what, what Paul is saying, the opposite of leaning into the Holy Spirit, the anchor that's the Holy Spirit, is leaning into yourself. Now, if you're like me, I've leaned into myself. I've trusted myself. I've trusted my own abilities. I've trusted, you know, my education. I've trusted, uh, and I lean on myself often. And I've, I don't know if you've discovered this. Anybody else, have you, have you ever leaned on yourself, trusted yourself? You know, yeah, okay. Two people have. You guys are amazing. I, I don't need to preach. You should be preaching to me. We, we all lean on ourselves. Let's just be honest. We, we trust ourselves. We lean on ourselves. That's not bad. I'm not saying don't. I'm just saying that's not an anchor that qualifies as one who will never give out. Because have you ever let yourself down? I have. Many times. It's a wall that doesn't hold. And he's saying, contrary to that, the opposite of that is leaning into the Holy Spirit. And here's what he's saying, that when you lean in the Holy Spirit as an anchor, it's an anchor that will hold, not just, just the rope, it's an anchor that will hold. And he says, if you lean into that, watch what happens. This is what all the scriptures, I'm putting this all together. He says, if you lean into that, heaven is guaranteed. If you lean into that, he's going to bring understanding and make sense of the word. And you're going you're gonna to understand what it's saying. If you lean into that, you're going to understand Jesus and you're going to be able to hear from Jesus and you're going to be able to receive direct words from God and you're going to have direction. That's all good, isn't it? 
That's an anchor I want to lean into. That's better than trusting my own sense of direction. Not always reliable. But if I trust the Holy Spirit, he will lead, he will guide, he'll provide. This is, what, this is why Jesus said it's better. It's better that you have it because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen? That's why we need this anchor. That's why it's so important is because the opposite is leaning on, on me. Now, now, listen, when you get baptized with the Spirit, and when people hear this, and, and those of you who are Christians have been raised in church, you hear this phrase, you're going, oh, weirdness, oh, I don't want anything to do with that. Listen, it's all about accepting an anchor, saying, okay, you can overflow with hope. You can have hope, but you can overflow with hope. And all you need to do to get this anchor is Jesus said this in Luke 11. He said, ask, seek, knock. He says, ask and it'll be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And he says, whoever asks my father for the Holy Spirit, he will give. That's the whole, that whole passage is about asking for the Holy Spirit. And all you need to do is ask God and say, God, I, I thank you for Jesus, but could you fill me with your Holy Spirit? I want it all. I want all of you. And something will happen. And then the misunderstanding of this whole thing is there is a thing the Bible talks about called praying in tongues. And it, 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 this, I, I, this is a whole other message, and I've preached it before. But praying in tongues, what is that? That's when the Holy Spirit inside of you begins to intercede for you to God in a language you don't understand, so your doubt can't stop it. And in a, in a secret code, is what it says in Second or First Corinthians two, in a secret code, the devil can't understand, so he can't stop it. And we make it this all this weird, crazy thing, but it's not meant to be weird. It's not meant to be a spectacle. It's not meant to be something that draws attention to itself. It's meant to be something as a power tool that says you can build up your most holy faith. Jude 20 says you can build up your most holy faith by praying in the spirit. It does something in you. And if you're, all of this stuff, I don't have time to explain all this stuff, but we're going to go a whole lot deeper in this in the devotional this week, and I encourage you to read the devotional. If you don't have one yet, you can get one on the way out. But I'm also in, really encouraging you to get into a connect group this week, because this is going to be discussed, and we can take this to the whole other level. But I, my challenge to you is this, and this is today's takeaway. My challenge to you is there's no such thing as a wireless anchor. <laughs> there's no such thing as a wireless anchor. Hope has a rope. And the rope is the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is our fourth anchor as well. So that we can overflow with hope. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And thank you, God, for sending us your Holy Spirit. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming and, and for residing God's presence residing in us and giving us a confident assurance and overflowing of of hope and of peace that passes all understanding joy that is our strength and God I pray that you would begin to minister to each one and help us to get past some of our preconceived ideas and begin to focus on the power that is you in Jesus mighty name amen now if you're here this morning you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus you need to meet my Jesus. I don't know, like I said earlier in the service, I don't know how people do life, face storms without the hope that is Jesus. And it's not about joining our church, not at all. It's not about joining a religion. Jesus was against religion. It's about a personal relationship with God himself, and he wants to be your anchor, your hope. And so I'm going to lead us in a prayer so powerful. If you pray this prayer, you can begin a relationship with Jesus personally right here, right now. Because Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, said this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is God, and that's what we're gonna do in the prayer, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer together. Everyone repeat this after me. Those of you watching online, you can repeat this after me where you are. Let's pray this together. Dear Jesus, I confess that you are God. And I believe that you rose again from the dead. And I ask you right now to forgive me of all my sins. 
to become my Lord and my Savior. And so I give my heart to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray this prayer for the first time, I don't embarrass anybody or call anybody out. You can ask everyone to keep their eyes closed, heads bowed. If you pray this prayer the first time, you want to begin a relationship with Jesus, could you just slip up your hand and hold it up until I see it? Say, I want to begin a relationship with Jesus. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Awesome, yeah, thanks. I'll look around one more time, make sure I didn't miss anyone. Awesome, yeah, thanks, guys. Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. Yeah.